I just saw I have a bunch of apps running that, oh, goodness. At this point, we're recording, but i got to close all these apps so it records more efficiently. Okay, we're going to be talking about falling objects today. Before I start, let me say congratulations to you Bronco fans. That was actually a pretty fun game. And uh, remember, no food and drink in this room. <laughs> I'm trying to enforce the rules. Um, <clears throat> the, the Patriots had plenty of opportunities, but every time the Broncos defense came up big, it was fun to watch, even though, you know, as I expressed before the game, I was really hoping neither team could win. Didn't happen. Okay, so we're going to steady falling objects. And start, and pretty much end with this picture. When you drop an object, how does it behave? For, so, you know, very simple and obvious question. If I let go of this ball, what happens? It goes down. Bigger question, the physics question, is about why does that happen? Okay, gravity. So we all know that. Now, I'm not going to expand more on gravity right now because we're not to what we call dynamics where we're studying the forces that cause it. We're in kinematics where we're just studying how it moves. But it has an acceleration that's caused by gravity. What is acceleration? Not just the change in velocity. Well, velocity includes direction, so that was okay. But there's another piece to it. Velocity is the rate of change in velocity, or acceleration is the rate of change in velocity. It's not just the change in velocity, but it's divided by the time it took. Remember, that gave it those funny units of meters per second squared. And so when I drop something, it has a downward acceleration that is due to gravity. Now that downward acceleration actually varies from place to place in the Earth. If you go somewhere that is closer to the center of the Earth, it's going to be slightly different than if you go somewhere that's far from the center of the Earth. So, as you may or may not know, the Earth is not a perfect sphere. The Earth is much like me, it's grown a little on its waist. So the equator has a bigger radius than the poles. And the result of that is that at the poles, you would actually, was it weigh more? Because you'd have a higher acceleration of gravity, the equator you'd weigh less. Or to put it another way, if I were to go from here to Denver, I'd lose weight. Because um, the acceleration of gravity would drop by a really, really tiny amount. I wouldn't lose any mass. The amount of me present wouldn't change, but the weight would. If I went to the moon, and I'll show you a video of the moon later in the lecture on the moon. Um, video of the moon, look, there it is. Um, on the moon, I would weigh one-sixth of what I weigh, but my mass would be the same. Okay, so we have a downward acceleration. We actually define the downward direction as the direction that gravity makes things fall. That's how we define down. So as you go around the Earth, we always agree where down is, but if you realize that the Earth, and I have to change away from a white pin, since the Earth is a sphere, over here, down is that direction, over here, down is that direction, what they have in common is that they're pointing toward the center of the Earth, because the gravity is always going toward the center of the Earth. The acceleration of gravity has a symbol G, and a value of 9.8 meters per second squared. Now I said 9.8, I wrote 9.80. Why did I put that zero there? Yeah, I know that number, that, num that digit is zero. Now I told you also this actually changes a little bit by location. So like if we were in San Francisco, it's pretty much exactly 9.80. Here it's really close, but it's not exactly right. Some textbooks actually use 9.81. I think that's because that way a student doesn't 
get lazy and drop off the last digit. <laughs> right, 9.80, it's easy to get lazy and just put 9.8. So they put 9.81 so you don't get lazy and drop off that digit. So this is the acceleration that something experiences when it falls. Now there's some questions here. Do objects behave differently if they have different masses or different shapes? So for instance, different masses. I have two balls here, a ping pong ball and a tennis ball. Are they going to behave differently when I drop them? No. Now this is science. You know, we always test these things, so we drop them and yeah, it seems pretty much the same. Now let's take a, this, this, and drop them. Are they going to behave the same, having different shapes? Yeah, they, they were different. Now, for a general, for a physics class like this, we are going to make an assumption that they did behave the same, and you saw that wasn't correct. Why did this fall differently than this? Okay, there's more force of air resistance. Once again, that word force. So there was something going on there. We are going to make the assumption unless we're told otherwise, that air has no effect. We know that's not true, right? You ride your car, you put your hand out the window, pulls it back. You drive it faster, pulls it back more. So we know that that's not a true assumption, but it's an assumption we make to make life easier. Now, if we go back historically, we had people like Aristotle, who studied things like falling balls. And they said, well, you know, this ball falls, more rapidly than this paper fell, why? And he came up with a really interesting theory. Now, was Aristotle, would you consider him a, a smart dude? I think we, we all pretty much agree, he's a smart dude. Here's what he came up with, with our knowledge today, it seems laughable. He said that everything is made up of one of four elements. Now there's a quintessence for things that are you know, out there in the heavens. But everything that's on Earth is made of one of these four elements. And those four elements, much like the band, are Earth, water, okay, so the band is rain, air, fire. The four elements that everything was made up of. And these four elements have their natural place. And things want to go to their natural place, right? My natural place is clearly in bed. So I want to go to bed. And so if you have something that's made of Earth, it naturally wants to go to Earth's natural location. Where do you find Earth? <laughs> down. So things made of Earth naturally fell down. So this ball falls down because of the Earth in it. Then we have water. You typically find water on top of the earth, right? You have lakes where there's water on top of the earth. And so he said, okay, so water's natural location is just above the earth. And then you have air. Where do you find air? Just above water. Just above water. Now, the fire one's the one that's a little less logical. If you have fire, the smoke rises. And so he said, okay, so the fire wants to go up above the air. And so these things had just those elements, and he said, okay, so when I drop these, I must have had about the same amounts of, you know, earth and whatnot, so they fell the same. But if something had more earth in it, it would fall faster, at a constant speed, by the way. So basically, the second I let go, it's at its top speed, and just keeps going at that top speed, was Aristotle's theory. And so something with more earth, will fall faster. Something with less earth, more air, will fall much more slowly. And so that was how Aristotle explained it. Well, how did we come to a different understanding? Who do you think was really important in coming to a different understanding of how things fall? Isaac Newton is important, but 100 years before him, there was Galileo. You said that afterward, right? I started responding to Isaac Newton, and then it hit me. You said Galileo, too. Galileo is the person who really gets the credit 
for helping us understand this. Now, Galileo took a different philosophical view, if you will, from Aristotle. Right? Aristotle stuff has natural motion, and in fact, it wants to come to rest. It wants to get to its natural position and then stay there. And so he said the natural motion for things is to be at rest at their natural position. So I have, for instance, this here. Stay. If I push it, I made an unnatural motion. But what does it want to do? It wants to go back to its natural motion of at rest. So I push it. And it stops just because that's what it's supposed to do. Because its natural thing is to be stopped, and it was unnatural that I made it move. And Galileo said, I don't think that's right. I think stuff just wants to travel. I mean, it'll do whatever. You make it move, and it'll just keep going. Unless you make it change, or something makes it change. So Galileo changed the whole view that things move if something makes them move. They change their motion if something makes them change their motion. And so he said, there must be something that makes this ball fall down. And of course, it was Newton that helped us understand that much more carefully. And so you probably know about the oh, questionable, apocryphal, whatever word you want to use, experiment of Galileo going up to the top of the Leaning Tower of Pisa and dropping Two balls. You guys heard that story? Mm -hmm. Now, that was to test his idea that was things fall with a constant acceleration, which is what I posited at the beginning of the lecture, that they fall with constant acceleration g, versus Aristotle's idea that the one that has more earth is going to fall at a faster constant speed. So now, like I said, it's questionable if he actually did this. It is much more likely that, well, I mean, we're not, nobody's there <laughs> that is here today. Um, but historians believe probably he made this as an example for people to think about. If you took two balls and one had twice the earth of the other, twice the mass, twice as heavy as far as they're concerned, since that's what you're more comfortable with. Two balls that have one's twice the mass of the other and you drop them from a really high distance, you should start to notice any differences. Now, according to Aristotle, the one that has twice the earth should fall at twice the speed, and so it should hit the ground much more rapidly than the other. Right? It should take twice as long for the one that's lighter than the heavy, one that's heavier. Whereas Galileo said they fall with a constant distortion of gravity, and so they just speed up continually until they hit the ground, and the excuse me, acceleration is the same for both. And then he said, okay, so you know, we drop them off the lean tower pizza, what's going to happen? He probably didn't do it, but what we do know that he did do was lots of experiments with ramps, rolling things down ramps. So he would take like these two balls and roll them down the ramp, should have the same outcome as that experiment did. So he definitely did do experiments. In fact, he's considered the father of experimental science because he tested his ideas with experiments to see if they were right. And, of course, what he found is what we know today, what I started with, that things fall with a constant acceleration if we can ignore the air resistance. If we have, like, a steel ball, it's got to go really fast before the air resistance makes a significant difference to it. And so we generally could ignore that. Whereas with the paper towel, not so much. The air resistance made a quick difference. So different situations, our approximation, the air resistance makes no difference. Is better or worse? Um, by the way, an example. What happens if you happen to be <clears throat> walking under a very tall building and somebody at the top says, hey, I'm going to flip a penny off of here, and it comes down and hits you in the head? You know, so like Empire State Building, somebody tosses a penny, comes down, hits you in the head. What's going to happen? It's going to hurt. It might break skin. It what? It might break skin. It might break skin. It's not going to do any worse than that, though. There are a lot of people believe, you know, it'll go right through the concrete. If it hits you on the head, right through you. No. It doesn't because our approximation 
the air resistance doesn't matter. It's a bad approximation. And so after it's fallen about six floors, it reaches what we call terminal velocity. It's as fast as it's going to go, and it just goes at that speed the rest of the time. And Mythbusters actually did an experiment with this. They modified a staple gun to shoot pennies. And then they tested you know, the, the velocity and terminal velocity of the pennies. It was pretty fun. You know, in Mythbusters, they do stupid things like, oh, I think I can handle that. Go ahead and shoot me. They did one with uh, if you could cut somebody's juggler with a playing card by flicking it. They decide, no, nah, it couldn't be done. So uh, I think it was Adams out there with his shirt off. <laughs> it's stuck in his chest. That was pretty fun. Um, anyway, so let's talk about these falling objects. I already said virtually everything on here. The acceleration of gravity is downward. It's constant. And it's due to a force that we'll learn about later. So here's the kind of experiment that Galileo Galilei actually did. Things like you put a marble on a ruler and you let it roll and you measure things like how fast it's going at the bottom and how long it took. According to Aristotle's theory, what would the answer be to the first question? Does the marble pick up speed as it rolls? Yeah, he would have said no. It's just going to go to constant speed down there. What Galileo say? Which? Yes. yes, yes. Galileo said yes, it's going to pick up speed, it's going to accelerate. And of course, this being a science class, for lab today, we're going to be doing a lot of studying of graphing of motion. But we will, in a week, graph motion with stuff going down a slope like this. So you can actually test this in lab to see. Galileo right or you know, Aristotle? Who do you think's right? <laughs> Galileo. OK, so our first question. Remember, it's channel 33 on uh, the clickers. Flashes of a stroboscope, that's just a strobe light with a camera that's constantly on, are taking pictures of a ball falling. And so each picture of that ball is the same time gap between them. So, you know, this is like, let's say this is at time zero right here. Then this is, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 seconds, right? They're, they're all interval, um, same time between them. So now the first qu question is just to make sure you understand this situation. How does the distance between each flash change? Actually, that's a little more. How does the distance between each flash change? And we have... Apparently, I didn't put Denford's code number in. I, can, I thought I did. Have you answered? There we go. OK, so we have the answers were 2, 2, and 6. So looking at these, two people said, that the distance between here and here, d final, two people said that distance is smaller than the distance up here. OK, that's in the middle. Does that seem right? No. So the first one can't be right. It is definitely a bigger distance at the bottom. If it's a bigger distance to the bottom, then remains constant isn't right. So we can see from observation that the distance between the ball for each flash of light is getting bigger. The top two, they overlap. The next one, they don't overlap. Clearly, the separation got bigger. And if you keep going down, the separation just gets bigger and bigger. So as it falls, the separation between the ball is getting bigger. Now, oftentimes, that's confusing to people. You tend to think a common thought is that they remain separated by the same amount. But they don't. They're getting farther apart. 
Okay, now the next question, same flash, the strobe scope illuminate. The, the first sentence is the same for all of these three questions. How does the average speed between each flash change? So remember, how does the time between the flashes change? The time is? The time of the flash is constant. There you go. <laughs> I just want to make sure people remember that. The time between each flash is constant. And now we're asked, how does the average speed between the flashes change? What was that? The speed of the ball. Yes, the speed of the ball. So we're looking at the average speed in the interval from one flash to the next. Okay, we had... So three people said that it remains constant, and seven people said it increases between each flash. Now, I put boxes around them. Obviously, they're not both right. How do we calculate the average speed? That's right. It's going to be the change in position over the change in time. Now, the change in time is constant, right? And from the last question, what did we determine about the change in position from one strobe flash to the next? It was increasing. So that means the average velocity should also be increasing. Now, one more question. How does the acceleration between each flash change? Okay, what we had were six, four, zero, zero. If I was you, if I was the student, I would have answered that one. Because I can't tell by looking. It's going to take more analysis than I can tell by looking. But some people know what the correct answer is. And the correct answer is the one that has the slight majority the acceleration remains constant. Now, how, how useful is it to you if I just tell you what the correct answer is? You know, that's like, okay, so I'm just being indoctrinated. He tells me the answers. If I memorize those answers, I'm good, right? What, what I want is for you to be convinced. Now, like I said, in lab, in two weeks from now, you're going to do some experiments to test this. You have a question, Colby? Yeah. Okay, this is moving well ahead of the topic of the day, but I will answer it because when you're curious, it's the best time to answer questions. So what makes things move is forces. And so what we actually have in a falling object is a downward force due to gravity that's equal to mass times gravity. That's a constant force. We have an upward force that's the force of drag that's some constant, and it depends on the shape and whatnot, but generally it's proportional to the speed. And then Newton's second law says that if I add up all of these forces, it's equal to the mass times the acceleration. So if I take downward to be positive here, then my force of gravity is downward in the positive direction. The force of drag is upward in the negative direction. And I have mg minus bv is equal to ma. 
If I divide everything by the mass, I get the answer to your question. Acceleration is equal to G minus B over MV. So as the speed increases, the acceleration decreases until you reach the point where the acceleration is zero and then it stays at constant speed for them on. Right, that's, that's not the topic of the day, but it's, it's a curiosity. And when you're curious, you want to know the answer or not, don't worry, we'll figure it out later. It's not very helpful to give you that don't worry. So how do we analyze this picture? Now, this is an accurate picture. This isn't, you know, some Photoshop picture. So if we take it on faith that this is an accurate picture, we can actually determine what the true answer was to that last clicker question. And we'll do it, first of all, by calculating the average velocity in each interval. Now, of course, I have all these average velocities shown, but let's just show how we would get one of them. So let's go the average velocity from 0.20 seconds to 0.25 seconds. Right, just define my interval there with the parentheses so we know what I'm doing. What's the equation for average velocity? Yeah. Remember, on the test you do have the equations, but I still want you to have the familiarity. Colby told me before it was change in position. Don't remember that, Colby? <laughs> Over change in time. So I just look at the data here. These positions have been carefully measured for me, so I don't have to measure them. I don't have to get out the ruler. And so I just take, when it's change in position, how do I calculate change in position? I've got the numbers for position, so how do I get change in from those numbers? Subtract which one from which? Subtract the second one from the first one. So since I went for this interval, I'm going to subtract. So I start with that one, 30.6 centimeters minus 19.7 centimeters, and then divide by delta T, which is the second one, 0.25 seconds, minus the first one, 0 0.20 seconds. So now if I do that, 30.6 minus 19.7 is going to be 9. Is that 10.9? 10 10.9 10 divided by 0 0.05. So divide by 0 0.05 is the same as multiply by 20, right? If I multiply top and bottom by 20, it would be 20 divided by 20 times 0 0.05, which is 1. So multiply top and bottom by 20, and I will have 2... Multiply... Where, where did I, uh, it seems like my number is going to be 10 times bigger than theirs, isn't it? No. No, that's right. <laughs> Apparently, I'm slow at math today. 218 centimeters per second. So that's how the numbers came about. Now, at what time does it have a speed of 218 centimeters per second? Yeah, somewhere between the two. And without knowing, and now we already were given an equation that we worked out that, you know, distance is one-half AT squared if it starts from rest. But if we didn't know that, we would just have to guess and say, well, let's go in the middle because it's somewhere in between the two. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to graph now. Lab today is going to be all about graphing and understanding graphs. We're going to graph that average velocity... as a function of time, and each one of these dots here is at the center of the interval. And now when you look at that, 
That looks like a nice straight line, doesn't it? When it's a nice straight line, that tells me, huh, we have some kind of relation that's going to be useful. And so we find the slope. How do you find the slope of a line? Slope equals rise over run, which in this case is the change in average velocity over the change in time, because it was average velocity, so rise is change in average velocity. Time on the horizontal, so run is change in time. But what is the change in velocity divided by the change in time? We have a name for that. Acceleration. Acceleration. Now there is that little thing about the average here, and that's why we tried to say, okay, what's the instantaneous velocity? We're going to put it somewhere, or speed. Remember I told you I make that mistake all the time between speed and velocity. We're going to put it at the halfway point and say it's approximately the instantaneous. That's why they didn't put the word average here. And so my acceleration should be the slope. So I'm just left with finding the slope. So I'll take from here to, well, I'll go to there. And so if I take that interval, my rise here is going from 100 to about, we say 490. So the rise is equal to 490 centimeters per second and the run is going from 0.5 to 1 um, by the way that's not 490 it's 490 minus 100 because I started at 100 I was like that's going to be way off because I One hundred four ninety. The difference is three nine. So three ninety. Ah. So now we just need to calculate that. Um, I'm actually going to make this so you can see my. Yeah. So you can see me doing the math here. Maybe. So 390 centimeters per second divided by 0 0.40 seconds. And it's 975 is the slope I got. Centimeters per second squared. Why per second squared? Centimeters per second divided by seconds. Does that agree with where I started this lecture on the first slide? Well, not counting the title one. I said the acceleration of gravity is 9.80 meters per second squared. Does this agree with that? Okay, I've seen some uh-huhs. Notice that's not the same units. How do I convert from centimeters per second to meters per second? or centimeters per second squared, wow, to meters per second squared. Okay, I need meters on top and centimeters on bottom, and I know that there's 100 centimeters in one meter. I don't even need to look that one up. That's why we use the metric system. And so if I take this, 975 times 1 divided by 100, that's 9.75 meters per second squared, which is different than 9.80, but it's pretty close. And so I would say experimentally, I have an error here. We calculate an error of difference. Which is absolute value of my experimental value minus my expected value, can't use EXP for both, 
divided by the expected times 100%. So if I do that, I have Nine point seven five minus nine point eight zero is point zero five minus point zero five. So doing my calculation here, I forgot that was sitting there. So it's point zero zero five one two times a hundred or point five percent error. I think I could hit that. And anytime I have less than 1% error, I'm going to feel really good about it. that seems right. So here we've gone through and calculated what the acceleration was for this dropping ball and found that it agreed with what I told you at the beginning was the acceleration of gravity. Hopefully, doing the experiment gives you a lot more confidence than you have from just me saying it. Because me saying things, I mean, I say things wrong. Sometimes my brain says one thing and my mouth says another, you know. And sometimes my brain is wrong. So, looking at actual experiments is the way to be convinced, not listening to a teacher. Right? That goes for all classes, not just this class, in case you think I'm saying, hey, you, know, you can trust your other teachers, just don't trust me. No, none of us are perfect. Okay, you can start answering now. The diagram, whoops. I do not know why that did that. Go away. There we go. <laughs> the diagram shows positions. I'm going to go back so we don't have to worry about that. In 0 0.10 second intervals of the ball moving left to right. So it starts here and moves to the right. Is the ball accelerated? Okay, we're all... I let somebody answer, change their answer from right to wrong at the last second. Here's our answers. Now, I want you to turn to the person or people closest to you. So, for instance, you'll Tyler turn around. And talk about what your method was for finding your answer and what your answer was. And see if you can convince people who are different from you that you're right and they're wrong. <laughs> I see a lot of, we're convinced that we didn't know what we were doing. <laughs> okay, so go ahead and answer now after you've discussed with your friend and neighbor so we can see how much of an influence your friends and neighbors were on you. And if they were a good influence or a bad influence. Waiting for Christy and Daisy to answer a second time after your discussion. Did you answer the second time after you talked over with the gentleman? Okay. We changed from... 
Okay. What was your method of analyzing to determine what the right answer was? I'm going to go with Colby because he was like, oh, okay, Zach's actually, I was going to go with Colby. was like, ah. what, what was your method, Zach? That the, okay, the number of dashes between. And so what did that tell you? Okay, what was constant between? Okay. Okay, the, we, he's gone through the progression of the things you needed to think about. The distance between them was the same. And since the distance between them was the same and the time between them was the same, then the average velocity was the same. If the average, right, because that said the velocity is the same. If the average velocity is the same between them, then it's not changing. And acceleration is the rate at which the velocity is changing. And so that sequence of logical steps brought him to the correct answer that the ball is not accelerating, it's moving at a constant velocity. Thank you. Another similar question. Okay, you can answer now. I hit the forward button in the wrong order. The diagram shows the positions at 0 0.05 second intervals, 1 20th of a second intervals, of two balls moving left to right. Are either or both accelerating? Okay, we had two, one, seven, zero. Now, this time I'm just going to explain it. Using Zach's thinking, I'll first look at the top line. He counted the dashes so he could determine if the spacing was the same. Do I have the number of dashes between each ball on A the same? No. If they're not the same, then that means the distance in each twentieth of a second is changing which means that average velocity is distance over time, the average velocity is changing. If the velocity is changing, what does that tell us about acceleration? Okay, it tells us the acceleration is not zero in the fact that the separations are getting bigger, it's going faster, so it's a positive acceleration. What about line B? Going through the same sequence of steps, same number of dashes between the balls? Nope. So that means it must be accelerating going through the rest of our logical steps. But in this case, the spacing is getting smaller, so the speed is doing what? It's decreasing, so it has an acceleration that's pointing that direction, what we typically call the negative direction. So we'd say it has a negative acceleration for the lower one and a positive acceleration for the upper one. So the correct answer was they're both accelerating. Okay, <laughs> I was going to do two problems after this. We have to first watch the video because, of course, it's NASA being awesome. Whoops. Uh, as you can see, it's currently muted. And it's working for me like a champ. That little not going to behave thing makes me not happy. I think it's this one here. That should be enabled, but... Am I doing something wrong? Actually, no, it's this one here. But it's enabled. It won't, won't bring up the thing to turn it on. 
Okay, well, I guess we'll watch it without the sound, much to my disappointment. So this is, I don't remember which astronaut, but an astronaut talking about how Galileo was the one who set forth what should happen. He has in his right hand a hammer, and in his <laughs> hammer, there you go, in the left hand, a feather, a feather from a falcon, because it's the falcon. Is it it's not on the screen. Oh, okay. I did not realize it was not on the screen, because I do have it set so it's supposed to be on the screen. I never did look back. I was describing something you see nothing of. In that case, let's turn this off. And switch back on. Who knows? Maybe this will make the sound work too by turning the switch on or off and on, power cycling it. It did. Now the sound's going to work. Excellent. I don't have to narrate anymore. I have a, a feather in my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. The feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for a falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two up here and hopefully they'll hit the ground at the same time. Okay. Actually, this one here is, is really cool. I don't know if you've ever seen it. This is simulating gravity. Uh, the explanation for gravity is that matter bends space. So That's getting into Einstein's description of gravity. And objects are not feeling a force of gravity, but it's following the natural curvature. It, this and guy's so a little this funny. Is a micro. Where do you get this? This is my old bike shorts. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, there's literally a spandex dot get a sheet like this and buy the sale stuff, so you don't care what it looks like, right? Uh, for like 20 bucks, maybe less, depending on the uh, sale. Um, and so you put matter and it warps space-time. And so I have another object, it also warps space-time. They feel that and they're attracted to each other. So that's, that's the Einstein view of gravitation. That's Einstein's picture of gravity. Objects warp space-time. Feel that curvature and move accordingly. And if you have more mass, uh, it's right there. Actually, because I want to do a problem, I'm gonna, gonna go ahead and stop it. It's it's a pretty cool video, but I thought I stopped it. Okay, so when this comes back up, for our first lab, you dropped a ball one meter. And you started by estimating how long you thought it would take, and then you dropped it, you revised your estimate, you came up with an uncertainty, and then you did the experiment. And so here we now have the question, how long should it have taken you? What was the correct time according to physics theory? Whenever we solve a problem like this, now on your test, your tests are just going to be multiple choice. I'm not going to grade you on if you drew a figure. But to figure out problems in physics, I always start with a figure. So I'm going to have the ball up here, and I'm going to let it drop. And then I indicate what the values are. So I'm going to start with a height of 1 meter. Give myself three digits on that. And it's going to fall with an initial speed of 0. And it's going to have a downward acceleration of 9.80 meters per second squared. There's all of my information. Well, one more thing. We would put here x initial is equal to, hmm. I have to make a decision. What direction will I consider up? Will I consider it the positive direction or the negative direction? Almost always, I consider up positive. And so if I consider up positive, my acceleration pointing down is going to be a negative value. 
my x initial will be 1.00 meters and my x final where it ends will be 0 meters. Now I have all of the numbers and I just put them into the equation. What equation? What, what do I mean? I just got my number and I put them in the equation. I have to think about this. I have something falling and we've just been stating the equations that describe how things move. And so the equations that we had were, well, we had There was one equation, right? And we had A is equal to delta V over delta T. And then I combined these two equations with a fair amount of work involved. Well, this top one we would say delta X is equal to V. But I combined these and ended up with X equals, <laughs> I'm not sure if I wrote it all out this way. This is the fullest, most complete form of the equation. In the textbook, it just has the last term, the 1 half AT squared. In class, I put it with these two terms. Here I have with all three terms the initial position as well. And so now I can just put in my numbers. So I would have 1.00 meters equals 0 meters plus 0 meters per second times t plus one half, that's the plus sign. The acceleration from my picture up here, I decide it's negative. Minus 9.80 meters per second squared, t squared. <laughs> Guys, saw that yet? Yeah, question? Um, I, that would be being making a mistake. Glad you noticed now rather than when I got to the end. It would have made a square root of minus and I would have realized then that I'd made a mistake. Thank you. So now solving this, notice this is negative, this is zero, this is zero. Move this to the other side and change the minus signs and I have 1.00 meters is equal to 9.80 meters per second squared over two multiplied by times squared, bring those across, I put times squared twice, divide by this, and I end up with my time squared is equal to 2.00 meters over 9.80 meters per second squared square root both of those and because we're out of time well actually I can't leave it there it's just not kosher to leave it there I know you can't see my calculation but I'm gonna do it the answer comes out to 0 0.4517 eh, that was alright 0.4517 seconds. That's how long it should have taken. Most people got time shorter than that. I believe the reason is because you're generally late in starting because you're not anticipating the start, but you can anticipate when it hits the ground and you hit pretty close to the correct time on the hitting the ground. And so your reaction time is only at the beginning making your time that you measure shorter than it should have been. Okay, I'm sorry I went four minutes over. That's very bad of me. I'll see you this afternoon for lab. And yes, remember your potential test questions.